Matrix and welcome to Was A Matrix. My name is Looney and today we're focusing on your final exam prep for English. All you need to do to send us your questions and comments is search for Was A Matrix on all social media platforms as well as our WhatsApp line. All of the details are on the screen. We also have a cool competition going on for you guys, so please stay tuned to get all those details later on in the show. I've got our favorite sign language interpreter, Nicolene, as well as our awesome teacher, Sima. Thank you so much, guys, and over to you. Thank you, Luni. Welcome, guys, to the English First Edition Language Paper 3. Today, we're going to go into the Paper 3 in terms of the content, and we're first going to start off with the structure of Paper 3. So, your, Engli your English First Edition Language Paper 3 consists of three sections. We start off with your first section, which is your essay writing, which is um, uh, 50 marks and you are required to write an essay of 250 to 300 words. Thereafter, you are required to go to section B and answer a question there. And one question in, in section B, which is your longer transactional writing, is 30 marks, and um, you just need to answer one question there. And finally, there's section C, which is your shorter transactional writing. And in your shorter transactional writing, again, it's just one question that you need to respond to, and there it is just 20 marks, and the length of your response there is 80 to 100 words. So your English First Additional Language Paper 3 consists of 100 marks, and it is allocated two and a half hours. It's actually a very simple, easier paper to write, but we need to go through our notes, learn of our structures and formats, remember that spelling matters, and ensure that we consider formats when we are responding to questions and appropriate formats, especially when we're looking at the longer transactional text. So we're going to start now with the essay writing section where you need to select an essay. Remember, we have different types of essays that we've studied over the years, and obviously we have to respond to them based on a specific type of writing. So let's look at it and get to it now. So, our first type of essay that we're going to look at is the narrative essay. And you've all done this a long time ago. It may even take you back right to primary school. So a narrative essay type of topic is basically a storytelling type of topic where it could be based on personal experiences and it allows you to express yourself in a creative and quite often moving ways. So let's just talk about the narrative writing essay topic. So it can include anything from a childhood memory, or it could include an incident from an adulthood kind of uh, embarrassing incident. It could be anything that you could have experienced in your lifetime that you can actually respond to and tell a story about. Remember, our entire life is based on incidents that have happened in the past, and the way we respond or the way we speak of it is basically the creative response that we provide. So if you decide to go with a childhood memory, obviously you're talking about something that has passed and you will have to refer back to what happened in them days. So you need to go back and look at, maybe it was a school event, it was a sports day and um, something went wrong, terribly wrong and obviously reporting on that. But remember, you have to link it to the topic that you are provided with. So if we're talking about childhood memories, you're obviously going to have to pick this memory and go with it. Try not to pick too many memories that are not related or linked, and then it also distorts the essay and the reader might not understand why you are obviously speaking about different memories. Remember, when we are planning, it's very important to write down points. So each of our paragraphs should have a main point and a little bit of discussion based on that main point. So when we pick our topics for writing, we must ensure that those topics are topics that we can write on. Remember, the essay writing is 250 to 300 words, so it's quite a lengthy piece to write on. So we need to ensure that we have enough ideas. We must also be careful not to be repetitive and say the same thing repeatedly. So our es that makes our essay very boring and it also makes it predictable because then we're reading the same thing repeatedly and obviously the reader gets very bored with the writing. When you write an essay, you must ensure that you write a piece that keeps the reader entertained and obviously 
um, you know, the reader must be um, included in the piece so that the reader can actually imagine what it is you are writing. So let's go on and look at other types of writing. Then we get to the descriptive essay. Remember, all our essays should actually be descriptive, okay? Um, a descriptive essay, you describe something. It could be an object, it could be a person, it could be an event, a place, an experience, an emotion, or an idea. So there's different types of descriptive essays that you could get. The goal of this essay is to provide readers with enough detailed descriptions for them to be able to picture or imagine the chosen topic. So now when we look at descriptive essays, we need to be very descriptive. So if we describe a house, for example, in an essay that we are writing, we need to ensure we speak to the color of the house, the size of the house. We need to talk about the structure of the house. We need to talk about whether it's tin or brick or the material that it's built from. You know, every little detail counts, whether the garden includes, um, is part of the house, whether there is an extension or whatever the case is. But we mustn't go into too much of detail where we lose the plot of the essay. So as much as we need to be descriptive, we need to include descriptions that allows the reader to see what you can see when you are writing. Remember, every essay that you do needs to be descriptive, whether it is a narrative, a reflective, or a discursive, even an argumentative. So you need to ensure that all your essays include descriptions. So you may remember in primary school, you, you um, uh, studied the collective nouns, where we did a swarm of bees, a bouquet of flowers, where we spoke of bunching things together, a school of fish. So when we are writing our creative pieces, we should include things like that in there to make it more um, creative, to also make it more descriptive. So if I say I was attacked by a swarm of bees, naturally we would know that we were attacked by many bees and not just one single bee. So it's very, very important that when we are using descriptions, when we are writing, we are able to describe things more accurately and obviously using the right terms. Then also remember, we have been introduced to figurative language, your similes, metaphors, personification. Those types of um, uh, imagery can be used in your creative writing pieces where you write your essay. So, you know, if you are um, reminiscing about a dog that you had as a pet when you were little, you know, you had a relationship with the dog where you had an understanding. Naturally, we know the dog's bark, but you could say that your dog spoke to you. We, it's being figurative, we, we're personifying the dog, but at the same time, the reader understands what you are trying to say. It means that you and the dog are able to communicate. So we don't have to report in a mundane type of way of writing. We can report in a way that where we express things in a more figurative language, more flowery if you want to call it that, but in a language that obviously enhances the essay, provides a description, and also allows us to use our formal devices or literary imaginary uh, imagery that we've been taught over the years so that we can include and make our descriptive writing also a very interesting piece to read and also gives the reader the imagination to deal with the piece and obviously whilst reading, obviously be able to imagine what it is you are trying to say. So let's go on. Now, the descriptive, if we, um, the discursive essay, okay? So the discursive essay is where you are required to write on something which can either be argued for or against a topic, okay? So the discursive essay could be a very controversial issue that could be a topic in your paper and obviously there could be two sides of the argument. It could be, um, you know, something like um, bringing in um, more books into our library or having the library go fully technological where we do e-books. So obviously it's a question that requires you to either think about it and a discursive essay would obviously give you the pros and the cons. So if we're looking at making a library in entirely technologically advanced and having e-books in and obviously restructuring a library in a way that we can access it through technology only and not have a hardcover book in front of us that we can read from, then obviously your discursive essay is going to look at the pros and the cons. 
So example, if you look at the pros and cons of that type of essay, you would look at how the advancement in technology would allow you to read anywhere if you have an e-book with you. And well, even if you borrow a book from the library, you also have the same access. But the difference is, is that obviously the wear and tear of a book that you would read from uh, versus an e-book is different. So um, you could say that the e-book has a longer shelf life, if you want to call it that, where it would be available through time. And whereas the book that you would actually take through and read from would obviously wear out after a few kids have obviously gone through it and read through it. So we're going to look at these type of scenarios when we look at um, questions of this nature for a discursive writing piece where we speak to um, the pros and the cons of having a fully technological library where we look at only digital um, e-books and you know, going from there and working from there. And also you can look at things that affect technology like load shedding and how that can also lead to you not having access if your devices are not fully charged. And also, you know, the break obviously in um, data. If you're using data and um, the lights go out, it affects your, your data. You're unable to access data when the electricity goes out. So obviously that could also impact negatively on having a digital device, whereas if you had a book in front of you, whether there was no electricity or data, you could still read via candlelight. So you see, we have to look at all of these arguments when we are addressing a discursive type of essay, and ultimately at the end, we decide which one we think would benefit us or which one we would actually agree to or decide on in terms of the argument provided. So a discursive essay is actually an interesting essay. You need to understand how to very tactfully provide the pros and the cons for the essay or the, the, you know, the, the for and against, and then decide where do you fall in the scheme of things at the end. So the discursive essay in that regard would um, you know, provide you with more to write on because you are providing two sides of the story and also give the reader a chance to decide which side of the story they want to actually consider. They may not necessarily agree with you at the end to say that you may agree that technology is the better route to go because now everything is technologically advanced. But at the same time, uh, we need to consider that with uh, you know, the advancement in technology, uh, that is the way everything is going. And obviously, we'll have to find ways and means to deal with all the issues that we deal with when it comes to electricity shortages or no, no non-availability of data and that type of thing that may interrupt our reading processes when we talk about having a full digital library as opposed to having a hard back book cover. So the discursive essay is a more um, easier topic to attempt in that when you are writing your ideas down, when you are doing your planning, you have more ideas to put on paper, whereas you are going to speak, obviously half of your essay should be for the topic and half against, and naturally, you will have enough um, ideas to work around to deal with and obviously at the end come to a conclusion as to where you fall. But it's also you have to be very objective when you write an essay of this nature because you need to ensure that you're not leaning to one side of the argument right at the outset because then you'll suddenly be leading towards an argumentative type of essay. So we need to ensure that when we write a discursive essay, we have to provide a neutral argument for and against the topic, and only at the end make a decision as to where we fall and decide what we would like to, um, you know, um, basically based on the question provided, decide where we actually fall in the scheme of things. So let's go on to the next um, essay type. Now we're looking at the argumentative essay. So this is a piece of writing that takes a stance. Now this is a one-sided argument, unlike the discursive essay where you are allowed to look at both sides of the argument. So a good argument, a good argumentative essay, the writer attempts to persuade the readers to understand and support their point of view. Okay, so in this type of essay, you're basically trying to encourage somebody to adopt your way of thinking. And um, basically, you provide reasoning and you provide sound evidence on how to back up the points that are being made. So with an argument, with an argumentative essay, it's a little bit different, where you decide you either for or against the topic. You're not in between. So you have to take a stance. You have to decide where you fall in terms of the argument, 
And thereafter, when you are planning again, you need to include all the points either for the topic only or against the topic only. So you can't fall in between as you go on because then your essay would be between a discursive and an argumentative and then your formatting would be, go wrong. Remember your introduction is very, very important because your introduction gives you some sort of indication as to whether you are attempting the topic as a discursive or an argumentative essay. So if you decide to go on as an argumentative essay and very strongly in your introduction say you disagree with the topic or you are against the topic, and thereafter, later on, you run out of ideas and you go and you start talking about the pros of the topic, it would actually d disrupt the essay or the thinking behind the reasoning that you've provided. And obviously, the person marking your essay would see that you obviously didn't understand the difference between an argumentative essay and a discursive essay. So when you are writing an argumentative type of essay topic, you need to ensure that you have enough points to maintain the argument against the topic if that is the route you are taking. So you need to ensure if you are saying that you disagree with the, with the points provided or the, or the question provided, that you are able to maintain that argument from the introduction right down to the concluding paragraph where you basically indicate that these are the reasons why you are against the topic. So it's very, very important that we understand the difference between an argumentative and a discursive essay and when we are writing that we maintain the structure of our essays. So when we start with the introduction, we must maintain the flow of the essay. So that's all I have for you for the essays for now. I'm going to take you back to Luni and we'll get you after the break. Thank you, Seema. Matrix, let's take a quick break and we'll see you after the break. <laughs> Welcome back from the break, Matrix. I hope you guys are still enjoying the show. If you've just joined us, we are doing your final exam prep to help you with the upcoming exams. We've got a cool competition for you guys, so listen up. Waza Matrix is bringing you the hashtag Waza Wiener competition, where two lucky matriculants stand a chance to win two gigs of data. All you need to do to enter is head on over to our Facebook page and all of the details will be there. Thank you so much, Sima, and over to you. Thanks, Luni, and welcome back, guys. We're with English First Traditional Language, and we're looking at essay writing, which is part of your paper three. So let's get back to it. Um, now we're going to look at the essay format. Okay? So you need to decide on your topic, which is very, very important. So obviously, from the choice of topics you are given, you will choose one. Remember, in section A, you are only required to respond to one topic for 50 marks your essay should be 250 to 300 words, okay? So you need to prepare an outline or a diagram of your ideas, okay? So um, if we stop and we think about it, all our essays should start somewhere. So we need to start with a plan. And your plan could be anything from a diagram, you can list it in paragraphs, you can do whatever works for you, but so long as you have some sort of structure that shows the marker that you planned before you decided to start your essays. So basically what you need to do is ensure that you have a main idea in each paragraph and that your paragraphs actually flow from one idea to the next so that there is no break in your um, essay and the person reading your essay can very well understand basically what it is you are trying to say. And then we move on to look at your thesis statement which could be your main idea based on the topic you've selected. Remember, you need to have your introduction, your body, and a conclusion, and you also need to edit. Please ensure that when you are writing your essay that you do not include subheadings. Remember, there is no need for you to include the word introduction, body, and conclusion. The person marking your essay is well aware that that is required as part of the structure of your essay. So you need to focus on writing a complete essay with paragraphs and ensure that you have an introduction, body, and conclusion, and ensure that you have different points that are part of each of your essay. Okay, so we're moving on from here, and we're going on to um, other essay type questions, and we're going to look at quotations. Now, very often in our exams, we find quotations. So quotations are basically a group of words taken from a text or a speech and repeated by someone other than the original author 
or the speaker. Now, quotations in our essay paper, in our essay writing uh, topics, are included in quotation marks, and usually the person who spoke these words are highlighted at the bottom. Um, it's very important that when we attempt a question of this nature, we actually understand what the quotation is actually saying, and um, before attempting it, we understand what it is that is required. Because remember, when you are planning for a quotation type of question, it's the same process. You have to make sure that you include ideas. Remember, this is creative writing, guys. You must make sure when you go on and take a quotation that you want to attempt and write um, a response on, that you are able to relate to it, you can link with it, you are able to put in incidents that may uh, apply to it, and also scenarios, even current events that could link to it, even if it is a political quote or it's something dealing with uh, some sort of uh, science or fiction, movies, whatever it is, so long as you are able to understand where it is you're going. You also need to understand that you need to respond to the entire quotation. You cannot take out a word from the quotation and write an essay based on that. But we're going to look at examples from past your papers so that you are aware of what I am actually speaking about. So let's go on. So this is a question from one of the past year papers. It is a quotation. We can change the world and make it a better place. It is in your hands to make a difference. And this was said by Nelson Mandela. So it was a quote taken by Nelson Mandela. We can change the world and make it a better place. It is in your hands, right? That's very important to make the difference. So basically, what is this quotation saying to us? Basically, this quotation is talking about changing the environment and the world and making it a better place. But it's also saying to us that you are obviously the person that needs to drive this process. So your essay in this regard should speak about how the world is seen currently and what changes should be made and how we as people, or moving forward as the youth even, can make changes to improve on our future. It could relate to the quality of life, it could relate to schooling, it could relate to anything, even um, you know, with regards to education, it could relate to an improvement in our education system. So you could attempt this essay type of topic in any which way you want to relate it. You can bring in personal experiences as well that you could even speak about where you came from and how much has improved since and, and that type of thing. So quotations are very, very important. You need to make sure you look at all aspects of the quotation. Like in this case, we're looking at um, the change, how we can change the world and make it a better place. So those are two aspects that we're looking at and it is in your hands to make a difference. And obviously you need to talk about how you are the one to make a difference to this type of um, question. So if we go further on and we look at another quotation, um, go for it now, the future is promised to no one by Dr. Dwayne, oh, sorry, Wayne Dyer. Um, here, go for it now, this is something more current, it's so, sort of something that's happening in the present, right? The future is promised to no one. This is a very, very interesting quotation where it's telling us that, you know, tomorrow is not promised. If you get up in the morning, you're lucky, you're alive. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, the future is not promised. So basically this quotation is telling you if you want to get things done, you get it done now. You don't leave things for tomorrow. So now we have to write an essay based on something like this. So we need to look at incidents, we need to look at experiences. You can even relate to um, people, uh, famous people, and how they've obviously, you know, d developed from what it is. But we must just be careful not to write biographies in this regard. We must actually think about doing it from a personal experience. Maybe we can talk about how we have improved and how um, you don't leave things for tomorrow. Um, remember, your essay structure has to include a different idea in every paragraph. So you must make sure when you are attempting a quotation, you have enough information to write different ideas in different paragraphs that will obviously link back to the quotation, okay? And remember, as I indicated before, 
you must ensure that when you are writing your creative essay, you include the entire quotation. So you talk to the entire quotation. You don't only look at the first sentence and stop there, or the second sentence and stop there. Like for example, with the quote we currently have, you can't just go to the future is promised and, and write an essay on that. You will be marked down on content. Remember the rubric has three sections to it that we use for assessment and one of it is content and that takes up a large chunk of the assessment. So we must look at the entire quotation. We don't need to talk about the person who uh, basically said this quote, but we need to speak to the actual quotation so that we know what we are talking about, right? So go for it now. The future is promised to no one. I think it's a very simple question. It um, can relate to any experience of yours. And obviously how it can also re lead to something about um, maybe you procrastinated about something that you didn't want to do, like your metric exams. Maybe you didn't want to study. And then suddenly now it's the metric exams and you don't have enough time to put in the entire year's work into one night. So, you know, it's a, it's a whole range of things that you can think of and experiences that you can relate to, but also remember that your ideas must flow. You can't suddenly pick ideas from all over the place and try and make them um, link in a way that they may not make sense. So your essay must make sense, your essay must link, your paragraphs must link, your introduction and your conclusion are very, very important, and it must speak to the quotation. Remember, the quotation is the actual question and you're, being, you're writing a creative response based on your personal experience that links with the actual quotation that you are provided. So let's go on. Okay, this is the next quotation. Whatever the mind can conceive and believe, the mind can achieve. Now conceive, believe and achieve. Uh, Dr. Ntukoso Shlongwani is the mastermind behind this quote. So again, whatever the mind can conceive and believe, the mind can achieve. This is, very, very, this is a very nice topic. It's also from one of our past year papers. Uh, basically, it speaks to how we use our minds. And basically, if we are able to uh, think it, we can do it. That's basically it. But to achieve something takes a lot of strength. It takes a lot of um, effort and a lot of planning. And obviously, we need to have the mindset to get to where we need to go. So when we're planning an essay of this nature, we need to consider the three words that I've underlined and look at it, not in isolation, but how each one complements each other to progress. So if we go back and we look at the quotation, right, and whatever the mind can conceive. So what does conceive mean to us? It means that whatever the mind, obviously, is able to absorb, right? and uh, basically understand, conceive is that type of understanding. Remember, if you do not understand what the words in the quotation mean, you should not try and attempt to answer this question because then you may not be able to answer it accurately. So rather go with a quotation where you fully understand all the words in the quotation. So here, if you don't understand the word conceive, you're going to have a problem, right? So here, again, so what the mind can conceive and believe so obviously, our mind believes what we tell it, right? So if we believe um, a certain color, uh, the sky is blue, it's not because um, we see the sky is blue. Obviously, mentally, we also believe that it is blue. If we close our eyes, the sky, we still see it as blue. So the mind can achieve. Here, it is also talking about being progressive, OK? So if we are able to work our mind towards something and you are able to sustain an essay of 250 to 300 words on this topic then you are able to write a full essay and obviously talk about conceiving an idea believing in it and naturally finally uh, achieving it so let's move on from there we're going to go into the visual stimuli this is also something that you would find in your question paper sometimes you have two pictures and sometimes you have three so visual stimuli are visual images or pictures that provoke a response or stir an emotion within you that could pr prompt a creative response. So you, if you go back and you look at past your papers for English first additional language, you will see that we have pictures as part of your creative writing uh, responses. 
So you would have statements, you would have quotations, and then you would also have pictures. So the pictures now are a little bit different from the others. However, the responses are marked the same way. So we need to be very vigilant when we choose a visual stimuli that we are able to actually respond to it and write enough on it. Remember, again, I'm going to emphasize that our essays are 250 to 300 words. We should not be repetitive in our ideas. We should ensure that if we are telling a story based on a picture, we are able to maintain different ideas in our different paragraphs that flow. Okay, so let's look at some examples. Right, so this is the first example of a picture taken from one of our past year papers. So we, I'm going to very quickly discuss the picture with you. If you can't see very clearly, um, the darker part here and here are basically um, uh, dried up land with grass and that type of thing. And then you have a paintbrush here, okay? And then the paintbrush is obviously paving away and there's a small little person there. I'm going to say person because we're not committing to male or female who's walking through. And then you see there's these little lines here that make it look like a road, a street, okay? So it looks like someone is painting or what we would say paving the way for this man to walk through a forest or a jungle or whatever the case is. Now this is a very literal interpretation of what we can see. And then I also want to bring your attention to the source at the bottom. Okay, um, the source is google.com and it says 2019. You need to ignore that. The source is just there for you to understand where the picture comes from, to acknowledge the source. You do not to need to include that in your response because the response is purely based on the actual picture. So if you were to attempt a picture of this nature, naturally you could talk about how you've experienced difficulties in your life and you've overcome them and maybe you've turned to God and you found a way and God paved the way for you and you've managed to overcome all your difficulties and naturally you're going to list those difficulties as different ideas in your essay where you're going to obviously describe how you felt and what you went through and the situation and how people behaved and how your surroundings obviously were not favorable to you and, and that type of thing in order to respond to this question. So this question is a love, this um, visual stimuli is a beautiful uh, picture that can open up many responses. It can be a personal experience. It can be something that your parents may have narrated to you based on their past experiences and how difficult it was when they were little and how they've managed to overcome all their problems and obviously get to where they are now and be successful people. So um, this kind of visual stimuli can start off with a, you know, a difficult situation and end with obviously success and how people have improved their lifestyle and that type of thing. So let's go on to the next visual stimuli. And this is a guy, I'm going to very quickly describe it to you, um, that's sitting at a computer typing and there's a pen here. I'm sorry, I'm going to say guy in this one because it looks like he's wearing a suit and those look like very masculine hands to me. And then there's a clipboard here, and there's some very unclear stuff there. But again, the source is Equinox, April, May 2018, which we're going to ignore. We're not going to look at the source. And then we're going to look at this. Now, this could easily be about um, the current day situation where, you know, even now with COVID currently, everybody had to go online. Meetings were now done online. People were in isolation meeting over the internet. So there were different forms, meetings were structured differently. This could link to that. You could bring in that type of aspect when you respond to this type of essay. Or you could talk about the advancement in technology and how now people are able to, to work better with the assistance of technology. This lends itself to many, many different interpretations. It all depends on how you see it. But you must make sure you capture the essence of the visual stimuli in your response so that you answer the question and the content is not a problem. So that's all I have for you for essays for now. I'm going to take you back to Looney. Thank you, Seema. Matrix, let's take a quick break and we'll see you straight after this. Welcome back from the break, Matrix. I hope you guys are still enjoying the show. We are in the last segment, so take it away, Sima. 
Thanks, Luni. Welcome back, guys. Let's get back to paper three, English first additional language. And now we're going to look at the longer transactional writing. Okay. So in this section B, longer transactional writing, your expectations are listed below. So the body of your response here is 120 to 150 words. Remember, this is your maximum and minimum requirements. The total marks for this section is 30 marks. This is very, very important. Remember, you need to read the instructions in your paper as it indicates basically um, how you should manage your time for this question, right? So in this section, we could get questions based on letters. So letters could be friendly letters and informal or formal. And then we go on to speak to what exactly a letter is, okay? So letters are a form of verbal and written communication which contains information or a message sent by one party to another to convey the message. Now, um, I just want to quickly speak a little bit about letters. Letters, letter writing is something that we've done for a very, very long time. And there's many, many different types of letters that we write. But what we fail to do is get the format right. So today we're going to focus on the format of formal letters and how we should actually write a formal letter and where the addresses go, where the date goes, what is the salutation, how it should end, and a whole range of techniques and structural um, uh, advice for you to ensure that you get it right. Remember, a formal letter, 99% of the time, the structure would remain the same and the content would depend on the actual question. So, like for example, a letter to the editor might focus on an issue that uh, may be part of the society, maybe there's people that are littering the park around you, and you decide to write a letter to the editor about your concerns regarding the people visiting the park, neglecting to throw their litter in the bins. And then you could get a letter of complaint where you bought a pair of shoes and you're unhappy because the shoe opened up and suddenly the shoe is no longer usable and it's only a month old. So then you would write a letter of complaint to the purchaser and obviously all our letters, formal letters, we need to make sure that the content, the structure, the style, and the format is formal. So we can't fight with people in our letters and we can't be rude, we can't threaten them with law cases. We need to make sure that we are professional in all our formal letters, even when we decide to grow up and go into the work environment. So please make sure we do not fight in our letters. Okay, so let's go on and talk about it. Now, we're going to look at informal letters. We also have informal letters, which are written to friends and relatives for personal communication and uses a casual and a more emotional tone. But we do not go informal. We do not use words like ETA or how's it. We still must maintain a professional, formal tone because we are normally writing to our parents. Obviously, we have to show respect. Even if we are writing to relatives, whether it's an aunt or an uncle, there should be a professional, more formal response in that regard. So although we do call it an informal letter, we must make sure that we maintain a formal tone at most. Then formal letters are written for business or professional purposes and with a specific objective in mind, right? It uses simple language that can be easy to read and interpret. Now that's very, very important. We must remember, especially with creative writing, whether it's your essay, longer transactional writing, or your shorter transactional writing pieces, you must make sure that you do not um, uh, use words out of context. So if you know a big word that you've heard somewhere and are able to spell it, but you have no clue what it means, please do not use it, because then you could use it out of context, and then the meaning could be lost or obviously you would lose the reader in the process who would not understand basically what it is you are trying to say. So let's move on from here. Tips for writing formal letters. Our focus today is on formal letters. So we're going to look at structure and format and tips of formal letters so we get it right. Remember I did indicate that the formal letter structure is more or less the same for more f all formal letters. So the formal letter is written in a formal language and, and it has a stipulated format for official purposes and for professional communication, okay? It is 
to ensure you understand the requirements of the question provided. It's very, very important that even though you select a type of essay, I mean, sorry, a letter that you decide to write, that you ensure that you are actually answering the question. So you don't just go and decide you are writing a letter to the editor and you don't like the topic provided and you decide to go and write a letter to the editor based on your own topic. It doesn't work that way, guys. You have to answer the questions in the question paper. So if you choose the letter to the editor, you have to respond to the scenario or the question provided for the letter to the editor or whichever question you do, do decide to respond to. So moving on to more tips. Remember, you need to plan effectively using points that would be included in your response and ensure you know the format of your letter before you start writing. Now, I want to go back to the planning again, and I've said this repeatedly, but I want to repeat it again just so that we get it right. Remember, planning is important and it is part of the process of writing. You have to start somewhere and you have to start with your planning. So when you start with your planning, you need to ensure you have all your points that are going to lead you into a discussion in your letter. So you need to ensure that if you are writing a letter of complaint and it is regarding a product, you need to be able to describe the product. Remember, descriptive writing is included in this type of writing, but it is formal writing. So you need to describe the product. You need to describe where you bought it, how you bought it, when you bought it. You need to describe uh, what went wrong with the product. And you also need to, at some point, describe what it is you expect to be done so that the person receiving your letter has an understanding of where you are actually going with this complaint, okay? And remember, letters of complaint, we are not allowed to threaten anybody, and we need to maintain a formal, professional tone throughout. Okay, so let's go on. You need to be clear and concise in your writing. The tone, again, style, register, is always formal and respectful. We do not fight with people in letters. Okay, so then we go on to the tone of a letter reflects the attitude of the writer. This is a very, very important point, right? The tone of the letter reflects the attitude of the writer and you are the writer in this regard. So using appropriate words and sentences are essential in setting the right tone. Remember, it must be formal and respectful. We cannot be disrespectful in a formal letter, no matter how upset or angry we may be. Okay, then, now we're going to look at formal letters. The format, and this is what we were talking about earlier on. Basically, there is a standard format that we could use for all letters, and it could be used even for your letters of complaint and letter to the editor. Obviously, the addresses would depend on the type of letter you are writing. So let's firstly look at your address and where it should go. The, your address is regarded as a return address, so should the company you are writing to or the person you are writing to um, decide to respond, that would be your address, which would be the return address, should be written on the top right-hand corner of the letter. So if this is our page, right, this would be the top right-hand corner. So this would be your address, okay? Then the address of the person you are writing to, the inside address should be written on the left-hand side below the address. So the person you are writing to should go there, okay? So that's your second address, okay? So this is basically how the two, ad your formal letters should include two addresses, okay? Then you have the date, the date could go below the second address. So for different people, they put the dates differently. Some people include the date below the first address. Some include the date below the second address. So you can decide where you'd like to include it. But I would prefer if you include the date here, right? I'm just gonna put a D there. So the date should ideally go there. Remember, we should be, it should leave spaces, okay? So there should be spaces between the addresses and the dates, okay? And then you can write this on the right or the left-hand side of the address uh, you are writing. Write the month as a word. So if we are writing the dates, um, uh, for example, the 1st of November, we should actually write November in full with 
the year. Okay. So we need to ensure we write it out in full. Do not use, do not do this, as this is not formal writing practices. It would be regarded as informal and wrong. You may be discredited for something like that. Okay. So then the salutation or the greeting. We need to ensure after we write all our addresses and our date, we write dear sir or ma'am. You can use or or a slash. Um, if you know if the person is male or female, then you just go dear sir or dear madam. And um, basically, you have to start this way. If you don't know who you're speaking to, it's safer to do dear sir or madam, not to insult anybody or feel um, that you have incorrectly addressed them. So you use it always as advisable to try finding out their name. So if you know their name, you can go dear Mr. Smith or dear Mrs. Ndlovu so that you're actually um, addressing it to a specific person. But if you're unaware of who it is you are writing to, this would ideally be the format for the um, salutation or greeting. Then the ending of your letter, yours faithfully, right, is usually what we use um, in our formal letters. Yours sincerely is something we use in our friendly letters. So yours faithfully, if you do not know the name of the person, at the, you end the letter in this way, right? So naturally, you are ending the letter. You would say yours faithfully, and you would write your initial, full stop, your surname, and in brackets, you would include Mr. or Miss or Mrs., right? Or doctor or professor or whatever title you hold. And thereafter, at the end, we normally signed, or you could sign before you actually include your initials. The format is adjustable in that way. So you can um, obviously end off that way. Basically, the formal letter requires a signature and the details of yourself at the end. Okay, then going on, ending a letter, your sincerely. We did speak about this just now. This is basically if you know the name of the person and end the letter this way. This is more for the friendly letters, right? Um, it won't apply to your formal letters unless it is a formal friendly letter. The format, tone, style, structure remains formal. Okay, then we look at um, your signature, which is what we just spoke to now. So you basically sign your name. Then you print it underneath. You can do it the other way around as well, which is also accepted. The signature that you put in and the title in brackets, remember I said that if you are, uh, for example, you sign, and then you would write your uh, initial, and then you write in your surname, and then in brackets, you would indicate whether it is Miss or Mr or whatever your title is, doctor or professor, or whatever it is. And then that is how you would end off your letter after you write yours faithfully. Okay, so uh, it's important for us to write in the Mr. or the Mrs. here, so that the person who's receiving the letter, obviously who doesn't know you, will understand if you are male or female. And then in the return letter that you will receive, will say, dear Miss. Maharaj, the way it is indicated, and they would obviously get it right. It's just courteous to give them the accurate information, but it's also the correct format for the formal letter. So the content of the formal letter, now we're looking at the actual structure. So we're going to look at the first paragraph, okay? The first paragraph should be short and state the purpose of the letter. So whether you are making an inquiry, whether you are complaining, whether it is a request of something or whatever it is. You need to be specific in your introductory paragraph. Basically, you don't um, ask them how they are and all of that. You basically get straight to the point. It's a formal letter. You're writing a letter for a specific purpose, and you indicate that purpose, whether it is an inquiry, a complaint, or a request. Then the paragraph uh, or paragraphs in the middle of the letter, remember it could contain more than one paragraph in the body of the letter. Uh, should contain the relevant information, okay, and, um, the, the, and the reason for the letter being written. Keep the information to the essentials. Remember, you don't have to get too creative with the information. And we have to always be polite, formal, and we must ensure that our register is also formal, right? 
concentrates on organizing it in a clear, concise, and logical manner, manner rather than expanding too much unnecessarily. Thank you, guys. That's all we have for today. I'm going to hand you back to Duni. Thank you, Sima. Matrix, we're wishing you everything of the best for your exams. Please use our resources to help you study. And if you have any questions, please send those through and we'll help as best as we can. Congratulations to all the competition winners who will be announced on Facebook after the show. Visit www.wasamatrix.co.za for the schedule as well as the study material. If you missed any of the shows, they're also available on our YouTube channel. From Iluni, Mikaline, and Sima, thank you and goodbye.